Catalyst Redmont Conversation on System Design as a Team Sport. My name is Kelly Fitzpatrick, and with me today is Tom Johnson, CTO of Multiplayer, who has guested on the Monkcast previously to talk developer experience and why developers need to stop diagramming and start designing. Tom, welcome back. Thanks for having me. And Tom, for folks who may have missed the previous episode, can you give a quick TLDR on who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm, uh, as you mentioned, uh, co-founder CTO of Multiplayer um, and longtime backend software developer. Got my start in speech recognition and robotics and segued into telecom and internet apps, building systems uh, for companies large and small. Well, welcome back. And I'm going to jump right into it because I feel like we might have a lot to say on this topic. In various written content, you have made the argument that system architecture is a team sport, meaning in part that it is a concern, not just of a lone architect or people in architect roles, but folks in various roles on an engineering team. And this, of course, suggests that maybe things have not always been this way. So I have to ask for folks who are not familiar with the evolution of software architecture, how are things done, quote unquote, back in the day? Not, not to suggest that you have been doing this for a very long time, although you kind of have. Um, what changes have you seen in software systems that have necessitated this sporting kind of team approach? Sure. Well, yeah. So back in the day, you know, uh, system architecture wasn't even really a thing. Uh, you know, it's the developers would kind of like write stuff. And then you discover like, well, maybe there should be an overarching view of the software as, you know, as things be started to become more distributed and more components connected together you would see a system architect role, somebody who would decree, you know, from high above the way the architecture would be. Uh, that was okay when things were simple, teams were simple, everybody was in the same room and, you know, clear division of responsibilities. But today it's completely different. You have complex software, uh, you have fast changing software, you have teams that are distributed and you've got separate roles for a lot of different people. Um, and it's just, you can't have one person in charge of all that anymore. Plus, you know, it's better that everybody is involved in understanding of the, of this complex system. It's just impossible to have it all in one person's head. So it's, it's a requirement now, I think that, that everybody knows how their software, even if they're focused on a little bit, fits into the bigger, uh, bigger puzzle. And so Tom, taking a step back, it seems that system design is something that some technical practitioners learn about. For instance, when I taught at Georgia Tech, my computer science capstone students had to create these kind of like detailed design documents for whatever they were building. And I also know that many professional developers have a lot of like thoughts and feelings about say UML diagrams. Um, however, there are many folks in technical roles who, regardless of whether it was part of their education, e either to choose to avoid system design or are just left out of the process altogether. To your mind, who in an organization should be participating in the system design process? It, yeah, that's a great question. And I think that uh, this is one of the trends we've seen in recent years. It's really everybody. Everybody has to have an understanding of the system. They're just too complex for one person to, to know everything about and sort of dictate how changes must happen. Things are fast moving. You as a software developer, you might be focused on one part, but you really need to know how it fits in, what depends on it, what your dependencies are, scaling issues, security, things like that. So it's, you know, plus there are, you know, the other benefits for, for everybody knowing about uh, system design and understanding how to do it. You know, you have a better understanding the overall like application you're working on. You can collaborate more effectively with your peers. Um, you can be more proactive with things and spot maybe design flaws or bottlenecks. And that requires a higher level understanding of like how software fits together. And you have to take yourself out of just the code for your single component and go higher level, 10,000 foot view and look down and understand how things uh, work together. I love that idea of taking yourself out of the code for your single component, because in addition to thinking of the different pieces of say a project or a product, uh, often what we see 
is that knowledge across teams about what is happening also can be very siloed. Yes. Uh, so it, it almost sounds to me that this approach to system design is also a way of kind of breaking down some of those just communicative or yep. like very practical silos that we see. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and that's a must have, uh, you, you know, software these days is also not like all developed in house by one team. You know, it's now, if you're part of a reasonably sized company, you probably have multiple teams, you might have multiple platforms, you might have the APIs you provide to each other. But you also probably have you probably didn't write all the software in house in that company, and you've got pulling in a SaaS provider for this and a cloud provider for that. There's more assembly and composing of, of platforms from pre built services, open source components, uh, other things. And the, that creates complexity dependencies, and that's a distributed system. You have to know how things talk to each other, how things scale. It's just, it's a requirement that, that everybody involved knows about distributed systems, patterns, best practices, and things like that. And I also feel that in terms of who knows what about what, um, patterns that I've often seen are that there's like one person who knows how to do this one right. thing and yep. should they decide to move on to a different role yes suddenly everybody else is like scrambling to, to figure out like what it is that they used you know that this person used to, to do yeah and you know that that brings up you know one of the important things of, of system design which is having a great source of truth having great documentation about your system so that the knowledge in the person's head as valuable as it, it can be as important it is for you know, for the understanding to be in people's heads, if they walk out the door, that knowledge doesn't walk out with them. So that there, that needs to be out in a, in a place that it, people can uh, easily go to find, collaborate on. And that's one of the big things we're, we're looking to solve uh, at, at multiplayer is, is auto documentation of your system and better debugging tools. Yeah, and even you know, forget people walking out for another job. I remember having to document things just so I could go on vacation back in the day. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it, you know, it has so many so many benefits to get uh, you know to get information out of out of your head. Uh, you know, redundancy, just being able to take a break. You know, being able to move on to another position, work on something else, share it, not be the sole person responsible for the thing that you just developed and you know, to be able to hand that off and, and share the responsibilities. There's just, there's so many benefits, you know, first of all, everybody knowing about how to do system design, but also having a source of truth, great documentation, great tools for debugging, take the manual work out of like discovery and tracking out of it. So that you, you don't, it's just not more grunt work for a developer to do that. If it's grunt work, it doesn't get done. It gets done quickly, probably mistakes. And we've all, this is the, frankly, the current way things are, are uh, for for teams, just manually documenting things, sifting through APM data for evidence of a bug, that kind of stuff. And I've been burned by those things and I've spent too much of my life, hours, weeks, months of my life, I'd like to get back uh, because there was no other alternative. So we're looking to, to solve that, those problems. And I feel like anyone who's been in this industry for a while has that list of, of, I remember when this happened and I'm never getting those hours back. Absolutely. Oh boy. You talk about, uh, it's funny, you know, documentation seems like a boring topic, but once you talk, talk to somebody about like, okay, you know, how do you keep track of, do you have a system architecture diagram that's up to date? They're like, no. Okay. What, what has happened as a result of that? And there you just, people open up like a therapy session, like the horror stories, everybody's got horror stories of, of like changing something, breaking this, or not knowing that this was there and scaling issues or crashes for not having that great source of truth. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I used to work at a startup where we had, we would have, a, it was called the beer of shame. And if you broke the build, you, that you would have that on your <laughs> desk until the next person broke the build. It moved around a lot, but I, I feel like often these things would, would happen because of exactly what you're describing because of, of just like lack of updated things and being able to get to 
Um, yeah. And, you know, I've, I've seen that too. And you know what, and there's also a collaborative element to this communication. So it's like source of truth plus being able to share the information. So design needs to be a team sport. Everybody should know all the things or be able to access this information easily know that there's uh, it's, it's, it's factual, but also to be able to communicate about it, communicate because design and development is, you know, a lot of the problems I see are, are, are communication problems. You know, design should be like a team sport where communication is really easy. You're, you're basing your, you know, decisions and designs on, on knowledge that is factual and the source of truth, and you can work together, um, you know, a, as a team. So I buy into this kind of team view of why everybody should know system design from an individual practitioner point of view why is it important to know system design and is this something that that can help folks get a job yes so absolutely it can absolutely help you get a job in fact i think the interviewing process has evolved over time uh, yes you still get those questions about like code this in javascript or rust or whatever where you know you're, you're getting tested on your knowledge of a particular language but I find that interview questions and uh, I've shifted more toward uh, how do you build this app or how do you scale this system or how do you how would you solve this problem that's high level? And that's all about system design. You have to take the big problem, split it up into smaller problems, solve those smaller problems. And that's usually a collection of software talking to it. You have a distributed system. So so understanding that is is super important to get a job. It will help you get a job and it'll help you keep the job because you'll be good at that stuff. Um, you know, no longer is software just like, oh, tell me, tell me the little thing that I'm going to develop. I'll sit and, you know, develop that one component. You're going to be involved in multiple pieces. And um, it's definitely, I, I think it's a core skill that every engineer should have. Yeah. And to your earlier point, software today is a lot of assembling right? Yes. yes. It, it sounds like this is something that could actually help with, with like, like integrating all of these pieces together and not just, not just building. Exactly. Like if you, if you were to say, I'm going to solve this problem by building every single, single component myself or in-house or the team will, and there's, there are very good solutions out there that you could just use. They'd look at you like you're crazy as you probably would be. <laughs> so it's, you know, these days you look, first thing you do is is you look for stuff that's already built that you could use that you could bring in because it's not maybe core to your business either so you want to get you want to move fast there's a lot of uh software out there whether it's open source components or SaaS providers cloud provider features where you can just say okay i'll use this i'll use that i'll use the other thing assemble it okay and now i've got a couple of microservices that are specific to my problem that i have to write it's not something i can just go and get somewhere else but I'm going to wire it all together. So it's more about like composing and writing as little code as possible to get something something up and running. So that all, that has to do with system design. The more you get into it, you'll see patterns, best practices. There are lots of ways to solve a problem. Should you use queuing here or caching there? How is, and you ask other questions like, what? how is this gonna scale? If I had a million users tomorrow, like it, what would break or, or Questions like when stuff breaks, how do I handle it? Those are all system design questions. And, um, and, and as a software developer, you have to have answers for those. So in, in terms of things that organizations have to care about, but developers often don't have time to, is systems design something that can lend itself to helping individual developers as it pertains to helping the organization cut costs or build yes. more secure software. Absolutely. Well, you bring two key points there and they're probably the most important ones, you know, for the organization, they're going to care about, you, you know, like you can't just have this huge distributed system and like, forget about the costs and we're going to pay anything. So as a developer, you have to understand like, okay, what are the cost impacts of my design? And that's important. And that's helpful to the, um, to the organization. If you have good documentation, the people, you know, this is part of why, why it's a team sport, you know, it's not just developers involved anymore. It's managers and other people who have to be, be concerned about these things, pay the bills. 
Um, and they might have way in and say, hey, you're using this, you know, couldn't we use that? You know, this is very expensive. Maybe this is cheaper or, or does it have to cost this much? And they'll have questions. And I think if managers are more technically adept. That's another change that I've seen over the years. Um, so they can participate in these discussions as well. And developers will get that sort of feedback and need to incorporate it. Um, but the organi organization can benefit from cost conscious design. And security is a big issue as well. So we, we see dedicated DevSecOps teams that are will analyze architecture, not just internal architecture, but say the, the dependencies that you have externally for security requirements. And they may be required from a compliance perspective to meet certain requirements or objectives. And as a, as a developer, you have to understand these things. So you have to be able to like communicate about these things, have an answer for the, that type of organizational requirement. Definitely. Yeah, no arguments there. Uh, so changing gears a little bit, you have also written an article on the invisible artistry of backend development. That's a great title. I love, I love a good title. Um, and I agree with you that we tend to see front end development, especially as this inherently kind of creative field, but we fail to see the artistry in say a really well-designed API. Um, we tend to think of artists as these kind of like lone genius individuals. So how does the framing of developers as artists also fit with the argument that system design is a collaborative undertaking? Sure. Um, well, yeah. So as, as you mentioned, like the front end gets all the kind of love when thinking about like what is beautiful about a system. You can see the front end application, the mobile app or the web app, uh, and you might have a beautiful design, but if you don't have an, a backend system that's as beautiful and beauty might mean scalable, great APIs, you know, great design, uh, that front end app might not be able to do anything. Okay. So there's, there's this requirement that both sides need to be kind of have that, that beauty. Um, and I, I'd say that looking at a backend system, you know, when something is kind of ugly, and, you know, so <laughs> when things are hacked together and sort of taped together and, uh, when it's not, when it's well thought out, when it's well designed, when you can see the logic of it, when you can see the beauty, there's a beauty to that. And I think that backend developers, it's a creative act to do system design. You're asked to do something sometimes seemingly impossible, solve this big problem. You have to then think. It's probably never been done before. You have to think, how would I do this? You take that big problem, slice it into smaller problems, solve those individual problems. You, those are a lot of choices. There are lots of different ways to, to solve the same problem. Sort of artistry comes down to making choices a lot of times. And you've got the creativity for how am I going to solve this? You know, people are going to be using the APIs that you, you design the software that you're developing. So there's, there's an artistry to that. It's, it's invisible because you can't see into the back end system as, as you can sort of look at the front end design, but, uh, but it is, there's artistry to doing that, that work. Definitely. And I like that you say like scale as something like can be a thing of beauty, even though it doesn't have the same, like easily recognized shininess as a good front end. Yeah. You know, I, and, and things like. I mean, maybe this is just me geeking out as a backend developer, but you know, when you think about like fault tolerance and when things fail and what if this whole set of nodes just went away as things that, you know, these things happen, like what is, how would the software respond to that? Like a living organism, you know, how would it heal itself? How can it, can it survive? Can it continue to work partially available? Uh, and to, to think about like, what are the algorithms, what are the design patterns? What, what's the design to make that happen? And when you figure that out, it doesn't always work, but when you can figure that something like that out, it's a beautiful thing to see it working. You know, when your app is up and running and things are on fire in the back end, but the front end doesn't, you know, the users don't even notice it's like, it's, it can be magical. Yeah. And I look forward to the day where I see a backend system and it's like so beautiful that I cry like tears of joy because I have <laughs> cried many tears of, of like, sadness. anguish over the, <laughs> of sadness over like, as to your point, like horribly designed things that, that just yes. did bad things. Yeah. Me too. So 
let's say someone out there is convinced by this very podcast and wants to learn more about system design and also is very interested in tools that enable collaborative design, where would you recommend they get started? That's, that's a great question. Um, so it depends on how you like to learn about things. I mean, I love going to YouTube. Uh, it's a great, great, but growing resource for uh, system design content. One great channel is called Byte Byte Go. Nice, small, easily consumed videos with best practices and also uh, stories about how some systems are actually designed at, at companies. So you get a lot of real world knowledge for a small amount of investment in time. If you like books, there are a couple of really good books. So Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Kleppman and Designing Distributed Systems by Brendan Burns. Uh, there are also some great newsletters like the YouTube content where these, um, you know, newsletter providers have real experience and share it. And you get to hear, you get to sort of read about the, like the war stories and the horror stories and, and things like that, that, that are really, you can only get from real experience and it takes time as a developer to get that yourself. So that's, it's, so, uh, one is. Uh, system design classroom by Raul Junko and, uh. Algo Master by Ashish Pratap Singh. Um, and I think I'm pronouncing the names correctly, but <laughs> forgive me if I'm not. We'll, but, we'll try to get uh, some links in the show notes too. Yeah, that's that's great. And, uh, and John Hodges wrote uh, Notes on Distributed Systems for Young Bloods, uh, which, is, which is good too. Great. And final question for you, Tom, how can folks hear more from you and from multiplayer? Sure. So you can find me on Xer Threads is Tom Johnson three, and that's the number three at the end. I'm also on LinkedIn, LinkedIn at uh, Thomas Johnson. And for more about multiplayer, we're at multiplayer.app or at uh, try multiplayer on the social platforms. Well, many thanks again to Tom for another great conversation. My name is Kelly Fitzpatrick with Red Monk. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe and review the Monkcast on your podcast platform of choice. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and engage with us in the comments.